My name's Chris Conley and I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. My family was kind of a uh, small town country people. Uh, Munford, Tennessee was my mom. Covington, Tennessee was my dad. And uh, you kind of had two broken people. My mom's mom died when she was five. And then her dad died when she was 18. My dad was abandoned as a child, just literally kind of like left in a police car to be found by authorities. And so you just had two people that had a really rough upbringing. And so it was just a situation where a broken person meets another broken person. They fall in love, but unintentionally it's broken love. And then they had a broken family. And so my sister, Lynn, and my brother, Bubba, that's his nickname, and myself, we grew up in the midst of that. And it was just a, a situation where they tried as hard as they possibly could uh, but they loved us through the lens of their own brokenness. You know, my parents were married shortly after high school. My dad dropped out of high school, went into the Army, and then when he got back from the Army, my sister was born, and she's nine years older than I am. My brother then, right after my sister, I don't know the exact number of months, but he's eight years older than I am. So my dad, when he got back from the Army, went to work for Hart's Bakery. And it was just a local bakery, kind of like a Wonder Bread company. And I was the one that was always encouraging him to do better and to, uh, when we got in business for ourselves, I was the one that was encouraging him to get involved with the Pepperidge Farm. He had the rights to sell Pepperidge Farm bread in the Mid-South. And through that, he developed the nickname Breddy, or Bread Man. He began to grow that from one truck to five trucks to 10 trucks. And then he would buy other franchises like Or Wheat and Intamin's Bread and Cake products and eventually Own the Border, Chips and Salsa and things of that nature. He started getting more respect from business owners and business people and, he, and that helped him a lot because what happened when he got uh, around people in business, he was not only trying to please them, but build his business, and he liked the attention. He used golf all the time to be able to win people over. He'd work from three in the morning to, to 1 p.m., and then he'd go to Galloway Golf Course, and he learned how to play golf. He develops this reputation as, you know, Breddy or bread man who can really play the game of golf. And as a high school dropout, he's become a very successful small business owner. And then now is not only a member at a country club, but has become the club champion numerous times and created his own little niche of being the bread man that was a great golfer. When it comes to golf, because it was probably the one area in my dad's life that he felt respected, he'd proved himself. He had affirmation. In our family, because we had a small business, we would work with dad. I, being the only girl, I felt like the only way I could have any time with my dad was learn how to play golf. And uh, I wasn't that big on golf. I always felt that if I didn't play golf, there, there wasn't no time for us. So that's when I leaned into working with him to be around him. So that was, that was some hard work. Made me respect more of what he does for the family. He earned every dollar he made. He couldn't find time for home life because he had used all of his energy for the people out in the work field or the golf course or because he was a workaholic. My dad actually was someone that had extreme range of personality. If you knew him publicly, he had a great sense of humor and he would literally walk in a room and make everyone smile, make everyone laugh. He was a practical joker and just on the outside, honestly, one of the most likable people you could ever imagine. 
and he definitely cared about us and would do anything for us. I mean, when it came to golf, we he would buy the most expensive equipment for us, the most expensive lessons. He would send us to go play in the, the best tournaments. Everything was a yes when it came to golf. He's gonna do what I tell him to do. You're not gonna eat. You know what you're saying? You're not gonna eat. That's enough. Enough of what? Enough of you. Don't yell at me. 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 Don't it was not uncommon that when he was fighting my mom, he would call one of the kids in for help. And like, we would become the referee of the fight. Get out of my face. You get out of my face. You get out of my face. Not my My house, my rules, I don't care. And I noticed him looking at other women pretty quickly in a relationship. And I would do the normal thing that a woman would do, you know, was try to figure out or, or change things that I couldn't change. And uh, I would feel very insecure. The worst part of our marriage was probably the first 15 years. There were times that the smallest thing would escalate to a place that it just was totally out of control. I'm sick of the other women, Larry. I'm sick and tired of What other women, Janice? What other women? What are you talking about, Janice? So? Women, you're both. You're I don't care. I do care. I could hear them arguing in the other part of the house. And I didn't know if anyone else was home or not, but my brother came in to my room. Chris, hey, hey, are you choice? Mom and dad are fighting and dad's gotta go. You Where's gotta mom? get out of here, no. she's fine. I'm gonna save her, okay? We're gonna get out of here, you gotta He said, uh, mom and dad are fighting. And he said, dad has a gun. And he's threatening to shoot mom. And he said, I need you to run out the back door and run about a mile up the street to the police station. And I remember going out that back door. <laughs> and it was just woods, you know, to the police station. And uh, running through the woods, not knowing what was happening, or if I'd be quick enough, or if Bubba would be able to save mom in that way. There's things that when I think back, I think, you know, what do I remember about certain things? But then on the flip side, I think about what are the things I can't forget? And there are certain things like that that I just can't forget. It's a weird dynamic where you love someone so much and you want to please them, but it's impossible to please them. And it becomes really the biggest battle of your life is trying to please someone that you can't please. And uh, that affects you in a variety of ways. Look, you know how mom and dad are. In many ways, my brother exactly. was more like a father to me than a big brother. He was my assistant basketball coach, my assistant football coach, my assistant baseball coach. And I didn't understand this then, but I think the reason why is he had lived this life before me. He knew some of the challenges. Oh, and Bubba? Yeah. Thanks for keeping me safe. Of course. 
What else are big brothers for? And I think he was making sure some of the deficits that maybe he had, that I didn't have those same deficits. And that I would know that there was someone that believed in me and uh, believed that I could fulfill my potential. My dad, he never knew when he was hurting me. I mean, it was just basically the lack of communication. We didn't talk a lot. It was always the traditional work related, and I would get so fed up with it being about work, you know, and there wasn't no golf or sports with me involved, so it just, it made me rebel. When I think about my sister, Lynn, it was in 10th grade that she started making some choices where I think she found the wrong group of friends and that led to some decisions that caused her to experiment with drugs and things of that nature and ultimately just ran away. Bubba was a great big brother. You would not mess with Chris Conley when Bubba was there. So he was fiercely protective of his little brother. You know, oftentimes he'd make sure, you know, that I was connected with some of the girlfriends and things of that nature and that, you know, people would look after me. So he was just always bringing me along, sometimes maybe out of necessity, uh, other times out of protection. Bubba was really, he was a good boy. He was a good student and he played golf great, you know, and people liked him. He had a bad temper just like Brady. He, he was special and he was a great golfer. And that's what attracted me to him. And I guess he was attracted to me because I guess I was kind of witty and, and uh, played football and knew a lot of girls. When I started playing golf, <laughs> he would come to Dogwood Elementary School where I was going to school and he would come check me out of school to go uh, watch him play in his high school golf matches. And there's no telling what story he told about, you know, how many dentist appointments I had or whatever it might be. But I remember I would turn the corner and he'd be standing outside the principal's office and he'd have kind of one foot kind of up on the wall, kind of leaning back, and he'd just have a big smile on his face. It was just so fun to go out and watch him play because he was, he was shooting under par every round. He knew he was good, others knew he was good, and then he was attracting attention from college coaches. He was recruited by the University of Florida, by the University of Alabama, but in all probability, he was leaning toward going to Ole Miss. There was a day in my life that changed everything in ways that um, I could have never anticipated, never imagined. On that particular Monday, I spent the day working with my dad, and, and so we're just driving home, and we turned down our cove, 7918 Thornbrook Cove, and there were three police cars in the driveway. And my dad said, what in the hell has your sister done now? <laughs> And he pulled up next to the house because the police cars were in the driveway. And he stepped out and officers kind of huddled around my dad. And it was kind of evident that I wasn't invited into that conversation. And yet my eyes were drawn toward the front door because it was wide open. The front door was never wide open. We always used the back door. And I take two or three steps and I begin to hear the most horrific screams <laughs> I've ever heard in my life. It's a wailing, it's weeping, it's my mom. And I don't know what's happened yet. And about that moment, my brother's girlfriend comes running out the door tears in her eyes and sees me, makes eye contact, hugs me, kind of just kind of buries her head in my chest and says, Bubba's dead, Bubba's dead, Bubba's dead. I 
and everything stopped. There was no way to make sense of that. We learned shortly thereafter that he had just shot 64 in a high school golf match, eight under par. And he actually had to go pay a speeding ticket in Carville. And he had come from the courthouse and he was driving along those tracks. And this was in 1981 and there weren't arms at that railroad crossing. And two people turned right in front of Bubba. And my assumption, and I think many people's assumption, is here's someone that just shot 64, he's incredibly excited. He's coming to tell his dad and his brother what he just shot. Probably got the music up really loud. And he just assumed that if two went before him, that it was clear, and he turned right. <laughs> train caught the back bumper, spun his car back into the train. He didn't have a seat belt on. And somehow or another, the force of that threw him out of the car and he hit a telephone pole and broke his neck. What are the odds, right? The best day of his life was the last day of his life. that day changed everything about my life. I'll never forget when we went to go view his body, my mom was holding his hand and he had big hands, strong hands. And I remember there were times that, you know, you know, kind of, he would put his hand on my head and I'd try to hit him and I couldn't, I couldn't reach him because his, Arm was so long and mine wasn't that long yet. And, you know, and he just hold me there and just laugh. And I saw this hand that was so strong, so full of life. And I remember so many times watching that hand grip a golf club and just, you know, him practice that. And it had no life. And I'm 10 years old thinking, that's my brother's body, but that's not my brother. Where is he? Where's his spirit? And I didn't put it all together then. I didn't understand it all, but I knew there was something that had to be more to this life than just our body. Because my brother's body was there, but his spirit was not. And so that day began to define my life in so many ways, but it began the process of not only asking for more, but needing more, wanting more. I, I don't know how I could ever make sense of any of this if there wasn't more. And I was sitting there at McDonald's and I looked out at the counter and four, th four of our friends were there. So I went up to the counter and they, they told me that Bubba had died and mm, wasn't good. I loved him. <laughs> Hardest thing I ever had to deal with. You know, I have a, this guilt that I wasn't there for him. Everything changed. It was, it really, it was a big shift in our life at that point when uh, he passed away. I think that's when we all started falling more. And then I think the way that I grieved was how can I, you know, in a good way, I, I don't know that I understood this become Bubba. How could I become a great golfer? And how could I make my dad proud? And how could I kind of rescue the family, so to speak? 
I think as far as my dad was concerned, I don't know that he knew how to articulate his feelings. I think he was devastated. I think he was hurt more than he possibly even knew that he was hurt. But I think he just kept working, kept going, kept moving. There was a tournament founded in my brother's honor immediately that summer and they created a tournament called the Bubba Conley. And now it just kind of goes by the nickname, the Bubba. And it's grown into probably one of the top 15, 20 tournaments in the nation. And kids come from over 30 states and probably, you know, 10 different countries to play in this tournament. And so his energies were immediately focused in how to create this golf tournament to honor his son. But in many ways, that golf tournament created a legacy that was really difficult to live into. It's very difficult to be better than a brother who shoots 64 on the day he dies, and you never know what the future is going to be. And then there's a golf tournament created where you're expected to go win that golf tournament and just get better and better and better and kind of carry on that legacy. And I had enough success as a golfer and enough promise and potential that people saw in me that I would have success along the way, but in some ways, regardless of how successful I was at my age, it was, I should have been that successful for the next age group. So I remember one specific tournament that was a city championship. And at 14, I shot 69-70. And I won that golf tournament by over 10 shots for my age division, going away. But I triple bogeyed 18 on the second day and lost the overall championship, the 15 to 18 year old championship by shot. And so here I was after the tournament and my dad comes in. Chris, how in the hell did you triple bogey 18, son? You could have won the whole effing tournament. two parts of me. There's one that I am so pissed off at you, Dad. You know, if I could want to just fight him. And then there's the other part that's like, I'll prove you wrong. I get those clubs out. I'm going to go right back. It won't work. I will prove you wrong. Those are the reasons why I say that it didn't have to be verbalized. It was your good but you're not good enough. And that's probably a line that has haunted me my entire life. I remember I was about to turn 15. And we received a phone call. There was some representative from the church saying, hey, listen, um, we're moving out of the old sanctuary into a new sanctuary and we were cleaning things up and in one of the pews, we found your brother's Bible. We know your family would like to have it. And I couldn't wait to go get that Bible. And I'll never forget received the Bible, I went and sat in the back of the sanctuary, and I just opened it, started flipping through it to see if he had written anything, just to learn anything. And I just opened it up, and like literally on the page that I opened it up to was Colossians chapter three. 
and he had a star in the margin and he said, my life verse. It was Colossians chapter three, starting in verse two. And it says, set your mind on the things above, not the things of this earth. I didn't fully understand all of that in the moment, but it got me thinking about the things above. And a couple of uh, weeks later, the student pastor from the church called me, and I think he must have made the connection that I was there. Someone must have told him and invited me to go to a summer camp in Destin, Florida. I mean, we were Christmas and Easter type Christians, maybe Christmas or Easter. We were mostly country club Christians. That's where we were, you know, on Sunday. We were at the golf course. But I went to um, this camp down in Florida and the pastor presented the gospel. And I thought to myself as I listened and there was an opportunity to respond, I thought, you know, I, I know that here, but I don't, I don't know that I know that here. And I did probably what a lot of people do. I kind of waited it out and didn't respond. And then I went down by myself and just was walking on the beach. And I just kind of kept hearing what maybe I know now to be the voice of God through the Holy Spirit. But just basically I kept thinking, you don't have what they have. Like, there's a relationship here, and I wanna have this relationship with you. So I turned around and I ran back to kind of the convention center and I found the pastor and I said, hey, I, I don't think I have what you have. And uh, he led me to pray to trust Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I remember going downstairs and using a payphone <laughs> to call my parents and tell them that I had trusted Christ. My mom was genuinely happy and, and I think given the hardship, I think, oh, <laughs> anything to help, right? You know, help us uh, make good decisions and live good lives. I think my dad was equally like, oh, that's great for you, I'm happy for you. I know that he didn't fully understand that himself at that moment in his life. But it was a moment where I began to see how God was protecting me. When I was about to turn 16, my first golf match in high school was with two players that were seniors that were the best players in the city. Doug Barron and Sean McKeel, they both went on to successful PGA Tour careers. It was a big day. I didn't expect this, but my dad drives up right before the match in a convertible Mustang. He kind of gets out of the car in this big, grandiose way and comes up and shakes everyone's hand and he tells all the guys, hey, listen, right. if Chris shoots 69 today, you shoot 69 and this car is yours. Right now, right here, today. Serious? That's a dirty shirt. 289 horsepower. I mean, all the guys are like, oh my gosh, look at that car. And I mean, they just come up and they're looking at the car like, dude, like you can do this. Piece of quality American machinery right here. You can do this, because like they want to ride in a convertible, right? Get a feel for it. You shoot 69, son, that car is yours. Now, the unique thing about Galloway Golf Course is there's this road that runs all the way around the golf course. And so periodically throughout the match, you would hear those mufflers, you know, and you know, and, and there would be my dad sitting over there watching. 
Well, as I come to the 18th hole, I've got a 12 foot putt for Bernie to shoot 69. I do everything I can. I am confident I'm gonna make that putt. And I lip it out. And I shoot 70. Drives off back to the dealership. My senior year of high school was promising for my golf. The trajectory was on the way up. I was drawing interest from a lot of respected universities, especially in the area of golf. And so there was also pressure for me to get a full scholarship. So that also influenced some of the decision-making for my college. But really what influenced college more than anything is that I met Karen on June 22nd, 1990. When we met, like, he was the jock and I was the nerd. Like, that was who we were. If we would have met in high school, we would have never dated. Yeah. I, we were totally different circles. Yes, yeah. He, I would have just been like, oh, he thinks he's hot stuff because he's a good athlete. And he would have thought, I mean, does she ever get out and do anything? <laughs> um, but that was, it, 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 it worked. There was something about who she was that just captivated me from the very beginning. And literally within a month, I felt like I'm gonna marry this woman. When I met Chris, I mean, what he focused on was foreign to me because when we met, literally the kind of the stipulation was that we could date when the sun was down because he was pursuing playing competitive golf. And so if the sun was up, he was gonna be at the golf course. Well, and again, I was 17 and he was 19, so we're just little, you know, we're young, but I was equally involved in the television studio and production department at my high school. And so I was very committed there and he was, so we both appreciated a work ethic, a goal being focused. Um, and, and we do, I mean, even here we are 26 years later, we're a great team. My golf and relationship with Karen was progressing and and then, you know, it was one of those things where freshman, sophomore year, I'm advancing and, and I'm making progress and I can see that some of my dreams might be possible. But honestly, things really began to fall apart my junior or senior year. And I think really what happened was the pressure to be great became too much pressure. The first two years of college also, I was kind of doing the typical college thing, you know, kind of you're away from home and, you know, do the party life and all that kind of stuff. And, and I was walking through the athletic dorm one night, and this is uh, my junior year, and a buddy of mine says, hey, Conley, come here a minute. So I walk over, and there's about 10 or 12 people there, and they're having an FCA meeting, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I'd never been to an FCA meeting. I had heard of it before, but... I just really hadn't done much of anything besides kind of attend church. Well, I kept looking for my polite exit. Well, I just kept getting one conversation after another. I could not, just the way the circle closed, I could not get out of that circle, all right? At the end of the night, I'm nominated as vice president of FCA. <laughs> it was crazy. So I'm sitting here thinking, what in the world just happened? And so I remember going down to my dorm room and thinking, I don't want to be the vice president of FCA. And, and I was just sitting there thinking, the last thing I want to do is be a hypocrite. You know, I've seen hypocritical things my whole life. And I just, I hate that. But then I thought, but I sure am not living the way I'm supposed to live. I didn't get my life in order anyway. And so my first assignment as the vice president of FCA was to teach the group Experiencing God, Knowing and Doing the Will of God by Henry Blackaby. This workbook has now sold over 20 million copies. It radically changed my life. It was like 
God was in that dorm room with me. And we were taking Goth off the throne, putting God on the throne. And it was the first time in my life that Goth wasn't first. But it was the death of my identity. Chris Conley, the golfer. Chris Conley, above his brother. Chris Conley, supposed to carry the Conley legacy, was dying. It was a painful death. And through that process, unfortunately, my golf game continued to crumble under the pressure. But under my leadership, FCA began to grow and thrive. But then there was a church, it was on Memorial Day weekend, and they called FCA asking for someone to come preach at that church. The pastor was gonna be out of town. Well, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what to do. I basically just took things I had learned from experiencing God, put them together in some form of a message, and I went and talked. And God moved that day. And I knew that I knew that I knew that this is what I was called to do. The next day, there was a friend of the family that was a respected golf pro, owner of golf courses, who had given me a job to pursue my golf career while I tried to pursue getting a playing, uh, my PGA playing card. And I went and resigned from that job the first day I was supposed to start the job. And I started seminary a week later. One of the hardest things I ever had to do was to tell my dad I quit golf. He didn't understand that I was pursuing God. He didn't understand I was saying yes to God. He saw that I was saying no to golf. And when I died to my golf dream, it was also a death of his dream for me. And that created a lot of separation for a lot of years. It is my privilege to present to you Mr. and Mrs. Chris Conley. So Karen and I were dating throughout college. We got married on December 30th, 1994, and by far the best thing that's ever happened to me. It was just like we were on two parallel tracks in the sense that he was growing and I was growing. And even though like the last thing that we ever thought we would be is in the ministry. I mean, that is just the most, the f I'm like, I don't sing and I don't, I mean like any stereotype of a pastor's wife, I do not like, I don't cook. I don't, I don't know what you think a pastor's wife does, but I don't do it. Like, you know, that's just, and so God just worked it all out in the sense that you know, he jumps into seminary. Well, great, I could use all of my gifts and skills to provide for us while he was able to be in seminary. So Karen and I were married four years before we had Mark. And then Annika was a bit of a surprise. She was only 19 months later. Your sister, Mark. Oh. Two amazing children, boy, girl, in many ways, both very strong-willed and independent, but have been a complete, joy and challenge in the parenting journey. I felt called to the ministry. I wanted to make a difference, but I just didn't grow up in church. I didn't resonate with church. Church didn't make sense to me. And so I started dreaming about starting a church. For some reason, when we started thinking and praying about planting a church, it was just one of those things that it just felt like, okay, planting a church might fit our skill set. Like God might have equipped us for something such as this. I think that dreamer part of both of us kicked in and we began to dream about just how can we serve the Lord together and really create just this unstoppable movement of God. And we named it High Point Church. And the slogan was a perfect place for imperfect people. Our very first service, it was a Sunday night service. Uh, the room sat 300 people. We had 432 people show up. There was a group of young people that were believing in something bigger than themselves, willing to take steps of faith, and we were off to the races. 
When you create a church and your slogan is a perfect place for imperfect people, that's not just a good slogan. That's That's been our life. You know, we're imperfect people. We had an imperfect family. Well, in that, as much as I love my dad, I didn't want to become my dad. And I didn't want to be that sports dad. You know, my son at that time was like 12 years of age and he was playing football and he's playing basketball and the church is thriving and growing and great things are happening and, and we're busy. And I'm wanting to make sure as he turns into his teenage years, and I didn't want to put all that pressure on him. And yet in an involuntary way, there was times I saw that come out of me. And so I was like, I need help. We need some pretty intensive counseling. I'm, I'm trying to read God's word. I'm trying to pray. I'm trying to do all that to not be my dad. And yet I'm being my dad. So we went to Bernie, Texas. There was a man named John DeFore. John was in his 90s. He had been being a counselor, consultant to executives, you know, throughout his entire life. And that man was so wise, spoke into the depths of my heart in so many ways, into Karen's heart, into Mark and Annika's heart. And, and he gave me this amazing ability to heal the father wound. He said, Chris, he said, I want you to go back and talk to your dad, all right? He said, but when you talk to your dad, I, wanted, I don't want it to be this dramatic talk of all the things that your dad did wrong, all right? He's like, you're never gonna have the storybook, you know, kind of relationship with your dad. You just gotta redefine the relationship. And then what I want you to do is say, dad, I just wanna have the best relationship I can in the present and the future. And he said, if that doesn't work completely, I want you to give your dad an amazing gift. I want you to say, Dad, here's what I really want. I want to give you the gift of writing a new story, a new chapter with your grandchildren. And you have a chance to have a completely different legacy with your grandchildren than you did with me. And I believe, he said, I believe if, if you go have that conversation with your dad, there will be healing beyond anything that you can comprehend. I came back to Memphis, set up time to have a conversation with my dad. I began to say, dad, hey, listen, I know there's been a lot of struggles in our relationship. And you know, there's a few things that I just need us to talk about just so that we can have the best relationship possible. And, and his shoulders just kind of drooped and you know, just everything about his countenance was just immediately in that, I know, I know, I, I'm sorry, I, I hate it, I, I, I wish, and I was like, dad, dad, listen, I, I'm not trying to, drag up the past in, in order to make you feel bad or anything like that. I, I'm honestly just trying to kind of forgive and create a new beginning. And here's what I would love to do. I'd love to give you the gift of having a new relationship with Mark and Annika. I'd love to give you the gift of writing a new chapter with them. If you love them well, you're loving me. And dad, I really believe that you could have a completely different legacy with them shoulders kind of stood up, head kind of stood up. He said, I'd love nothing more, nothing more. And from that point forward, everything began to change. After Chris went and talked with his dad, there really was a different level of engagement. And we, maybe in the past, he might've avoided or just kind of minimized contact. It, you began to see his interest and him reaching out to Mark and Annika and just doing things to try to gain some favor and, and build kind of a new relationship with them because there had been a season of absence. From his perception, the rejection was removed and he felt accepted and felt wanted. He starts showing up at church more. Typically, he's somebody that's going to be playing golf on Sunday and he might come to church three to five times a year. He starts showing up to church two times a month, three times a month. And as we were going through this journey together, God began talking to me about how to overcome that voice in your life. And there's this, all of us battle a negative voice. And that negative voice, more times or not, kind of comes from your family of origin or someone important in your life. And as I was building this series, I thought, okay, the healing that's taking place in me, the healing that's taking place in my family, that I need to teach this principle to our church. And so I went and asked my dad, I said, hey dad, I said, here's kind of what I'm thinking, you know, overcoming that voice. I said, you gotta, you know, recognize the lie, you gotta renounce the lie, you gotta replace the lie with truth. I said, I wanna teach this series. I said, but 
in many regards, you've been that voice in my life. And I said, I need your permission to teach the series because I need to tell some stories from our past that aren't necessarily good stories. But I'll tell those stories from a place of healing, not from a place of hurt. And I said, so in no way do I want to dishonor you, but I actually want to provide hope and I want to provide healing for everybody involved. I said, how do you feel about that? He said, it needs to be done. I had two voices. I had a voice of my dad and the voice of my brother that were kind of there. So I had this big parent voice, and I had this kind of little bit. And uh, that sermon series was seven weeks long. It was probably the first time in his life he attended church seven weeks in a row. My voice said, you're not good enough. In about week four, Mark, our son, went over to his house um, after church. And my dad said, hey, Mark, um, how do you know, like at the end of the service, you know, when your dad praise that prayer and ask people to raise their hand. You know, like, I mean, how do you know, like, if it really works, if you're really saved? And then you just simply say this, God, save me. And he's like, I mean, ever since I've been coming to church more, I've just, I don't know if I've ever really trusted Christ. And so in that moment, when you say, God, save me, God comes into your life through the Holy Spirit and he forgives you. My grandfather is asking me about trusting Christ. And to have the relationship with him that he came to me about it, it's a, just an awesome um, memory. That every son wants to be proud of his father. And uh, I've learned a lot of great things from him. He taught me an incredible work ethic. He taught me how to be good to people. And I've been proud of you for many things throughout your life, but I've never been more proud of you than this moment right here. It's a long journey from the time I was born till 71 years of age now to develop a relationship with Christ. I wish I hadn't been so selfish all my life with my time. I wish I'd have spent more time with Chris and, and and Bubba and Lynn, but uh, I, I didn't. But now, God changes your heart. Uh, for the first time in my life, I'm at peace with myself and at peace with God. It's just amazing how much God can change your heart if you ask Him to come in and if you let Him. I'm Larry Connolly, and I'm going public. I'm proud that three or four years ago, you chose to reunite your family. Mom, your faith is heroic. And you truly married an incredible woman. So, one of the things that's happened as a result of this is that you've built a great relationship with Mark. And you asked for Mark to be able to baptize you. So Mark wants to say a couple words, then him baptize you. You know, Brady, when you moved in three or four years ago, you were still a little bit rough around the edges. But <laughs> now, ever since then, we've seen God do a tremendous work in your life. And so we're, we all love you and are incredibly proud of you. So it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. root this time. Uh, the seeds fell on good soil. And instead of coming to church, you know, five times a year, he came virtually every Sunday. He began to serve on the guest services team. You know, he was a, a smiling face, a welcoming face. He was still a practical joker. He would ask people, hey, what'd you think about that preacher? You know, and kind of try to just mess with them and then go, oh, I'm his dad, you know, kind of thing. So for a short season, there was healing in the family. Things were headed in the right direction. Mom and dad were remarried for the third time. There was a sense of peace. My sister was doing great and had gone through some recovery and was just uh, better than she's ever been before. And 
the grandchildren were doing well. And so everything was like, oh, this is what a normal family's like. But then I got a phone call, unexpected phone call. My dad had just played at Quell Ridge Golf Course. He walked off the 18th green and there was a young girl that worked there at the golf course that was, this was her last day working there before she went off to college. And he, with my brother's golf tournament and things like that, and just with losing the son, he really took interest in teenagers and tried to really be a source of encouragement and blessing to them. And so he had bought a going away cake for this young lady. So he walks in off the 18th green and he gathers everybody in the clubhouse and brings this young lady out and says a lot of complimentary things about her. And then he gives her this going away cake. And he turns to his right and he collapses from a heart attack. They called me and uh, they put him in the ambulance and he was headed to Methodist North Hospital. And I jumped in the car, drove straight to Methodist North. I arrived, I saw him, I parked right next to the ambulance and I jumped up in the ambulance. They had his shirt ripped off, they were still working on him. They were doing the best they could, but he was gone. I was holding his hand and three times I said, I've lost him, I've lost him, I've lost him. And as clearly as I've ever heard the voice of God, <laughs> or God say, I've got him, I've got him, I've got him. So I just held his hand, I said, I love you. difficult relationship ended in peace, ended with healing. And all of us, right now we choose to remember his best qualities and we learn from the worst ones. In many regards, I've experienced more healing in the six years that he's been gone than when he was alive. This moment, just trying to make it through to the other side. God, I really hate this feeling, but I know that healing just takes a little time. Sometimes we just were kind of best buddies. My mom would be like, hey, quit hanging out with Brady, come do your homework. You know, I'm like 13 and we're watching, you know, Western movies or like the 100th rerun of the U.S. Senior Open that's on all the time when nothing else is. This is not the end. Healing just takes a little time. Brady always said before he passed away, he just wanted to watch me graduate college. Unfortunately, he didn't get to, but he got to see a lot of great things. But I think for me, it was maybe more about what I got to see him do before I graduated college. Cause I know that moving on can feel a lot like drowning sometimes. We went to celebrate recovery and he was listening to a testimony. And when he was done with the testimony, I looked to my right and I looked at my dad and I'd never seen such emptiness in his face. I could tell he was looking and going, I missed out on so much. And I don't wanna rush this and I don't wanna waste it. And I 
leaned over and I said, Dad, I said, you're okay. I said, we love you and it's not too late to heal. And that's what he did. He was healing. All of y'all love him. Even today, y'all talk about him, laugh about him, all that kind of stuff. So I don't want you to lose that. Yeah, we had battles, and those battles uh, were pretty bad at the time, but I look back at them now, you know, and say, thank you, Lord, for surviving it. Healing just takes a little time. Here's the thing about forgiveness. It's definitely not forgive and forget. Please don't say that. There are things that I could never forget. But forgiveness changes the way you remember. I choose to remember through the lens of healing instead of the lens of hurt. And because now I understand my dad's hurt and I had the joy through my own healing to provide healing to him. I was able to take the forgiveness that God had given me and then extend that forgiveness to him. He discovered the forgiveness of God for himself. It's hard for someone else to know the forgiveness of God if we never forgive. And so what you want for your loved ones more than anything is for them to be healed. But in order for them to be healed, you've got to be healed. And often you are the pathway to their healing. Sorry.